We're getting the inside scoop on ESPN's plans from one of its top executives and a look into how the Dak Prescott deal went down. Plus, the body cam footage of Tyreek Hill's detainment has been released, and the Oakland A's found new ways to not care about their fans. It's Wednesday, September 11th. I'm Owen Poindexter, and this is Front Office Sports Today. Today, we are hearing from ESPN president of content Burke Magnus from our Tuned In event in New York. Plus, I speak with Brian Murphy, CEO of Athletes First, which represents Dak Prescott, Jordan Love, Tua Tagovailoa, and Aaron Rodgers, among others, on negotiating for those clients. First, here are your top headlines. Body cam footage was released of Tyree Kill's detainment by the Miami-Dade police. The video shows officers asking Hill to roll down his window and then proceeding to remove him from the car, force him on the ground, and place him in handcuffs. At least one officer was acting aggressively and was quick to escalate the situation. Miami-Dade police cited Hill for reckless driving and eventually let him go to his game. In an appearance on CNN, Hill said, the reality of it is if I wasn't Tyreek Hill, worst case scenario, we would have had a different article. Tyreek Hill got shot in front of Hard Rock Stadium. That's worst case scenario. Hill's agent, Drew Rosenhaus, said on the Dan Levitard show that all the officers involved in the incident should be fired. A new civil lawsuit filed in Houston accuses Deshaun Watson of another case of sexual assault and battery in 2020. Watson had already served an 11-game suspension for allegations of 24 counts of sexual assault in 2022. That same year, the Cleveland Browns traded three first-round picks and three additional picks for Watson and gave him a guaranteed $230 million contract, the richest deal in NFL history at the time. Well, those picks are never coming back if Watson did not disclose this potential lawsuit to the Browns and it forces him to miss time, such as through a suspension, they may be able to get out of the contract. Four players who played for Michigan before the NIL era want their NIL money. The group filed a class action lawsuit against the NCAA and Big Ten Network for being denied the right to earn money from name, image, and likeness. They all played before 2016, which is important because a previous $2.7 billion settlement made players eligible for damages if they played after 2016. This case challenges that statute of limitations and could open up the NCAA and its conferences to major liability. Red Bull's former chief technical officer, Adrian Newey, is signing with Aston Martin. Newey is praised as one of the most influential engineers in Formula One history as he oversaw the development of the car that led to Max Verstappen winning 19 of 22 races last season. He is not going to be cheap. Newey will reportedly make $200 million over five years. He will join the Aston Martin team on March 1st, 2025, meaning he should play a role over the team's car design by the 2026 season, which is a crucial one because regulations will change that year to require lighter vehicles, 50% power from electrical sources, and 100% use of sustainable fuels. NFL Red Zone host Scott Hansen walked back a comment he made criticizing Tom Brady's debut as a broadcaster. During a game between the Dallas Cowboys and Cleveland Browns, Cowboys kicker Brandon Aubrey lined up for what would have been an NFL record 71-yard field goal attempt heading into halftime. Hansen criticized how Tom Brady reacted to the moment, saying, come on, Brady has to get more excited than that in the booth. Hansen has since walked back his comments, saying it was unfair and inconsiderate of him, and that he meant it to be tongue-in-cheek. NASCAR has found itself in a stalemate with Michael Jordan. After two years of contentious negotiations over a revenue agreement, NASCAR got all but two organizations to agree to a deal. The two holdouts, Michael Jordan's 23XI Racing and the much smaller Front Row Motorsports. 23XI claimed in a statement that we did not have an opportunity to fairly bargain for our new charter contract. We remain committed to competing at the highest level while also standing firm in our belief that NASCAR should be governed by fair and equitable practices. 23XI co-owner Curtis Polk implied that the two were far away from reaching any kind of deal, describing the negotiations as David facing Goliath. Burke Magnus has one of the most powerful jobs in sports media as ESPN's president of content. The network is in a constant state of transition with plenty of on-air talent leaving and others seeking new deals. My colleague Mike McCarthy hosted our first Tuned In event, which brought together some of the biggest names in sports media. You'll be hearing from some of the big names who attended there this week, starting with Mike's conversation with Burke Magnus. So let's get right to it with Burke Magnus president of content uh, for ESPN. As you see, Burke has his red-eye coffee uh, after the Jets 49ers game last night, and he's uh, ready to go. Burke, uh, give us uh, your review of last night's first Monday Night Football game. Monday Night Football game is coming off its most watched season ever on ESPN. Yeah. You've got Troy and Joe in the booth, and you've got Jason Kelsey making his debut last night. Tell us what you thought. 
Well, listen, I, I've never felt better about where we are from a talent perspective on NFL than right now. I mean, um, uh, I think it was Jimmy Tra Traina. Sorry, sorry to bring up the competition. <laughs> Jimmy Traina tweeted last night that Joe Buck and Troy Aikman are not only the best doing it, they're the best by a wide margin. And right. I really believe that. And we're so fortunate to have them documenting the game from the booth. I, I really believe that that's brought a stability and you know a credibility to our NFL coverage that you know frankly was missing there for years after, as we were trying to um, you know get to a place where the booth was solid again. But not just those guys because they're you know they're the best. Um, but you know it's year two of Scott Van Pelt on Monday Night Countdown. We added Jason Kelsey to the mix. He kind of gave us right out of the shoot exactly what we were hoping right. for last night. He's fun and he's funny and he's casual and he's himself and he jokes. But then when you Let's really hone in on a point he's making. You know, the guy's a seven-time Pro Bowl center who's going straight to the Hall of Fame, and he knows the game of football inside and out, and he's still very attached to it. Um, and he was really, you know, interested and intrigued with our proposal to involve him in our coverage because we travel, you know, Monday Night Countdown to, yeah. to, to, to site every week, um, with the exception of those few doubleheader weeks we have. So... You know, Scott with Ryan Clark and Marcus Spears and Kelsey, rock solid pregame show. We had NFL Live there, Laura Rutledge hosting that with her cast. Um, you know, and uh, so dialing back to Sunday, it was Mike Greenberg's first uh, episode at the helm of Sunday Countdown. So, right. Which was, you know, I think pretty fortuitous uh, in that we had some real breaking news during that. You know that that window, which you know was Greeny's wheelhouse. Yeah. Uh, so uh, I was very, I'm very pleased with where we are right now. Yeah. Yeah, Kelsey brings sort of an everyman quality. Yeah. I think if you didn't see the show last night, I think he lost his luggage, so he had to go to the store and get a shirt. Uh, he's not an off the rack guy. No, he's not. You know, like it just wasn't. You know, <laughs> I could do that. He can't right. do that. It was a little snug. Yeah. Right. He yeah. can't just go to TJ Maxx and buy a shirt. No, right? no, no. Yeah. But uh, he, you know, he, he's. Uh, he brings a level of, of, uh, of like fun to the, and that's really what we're after. You know, sports is supposed to be fun. Yeah. You know, yeah. There's lots of um, information that needs to be communicated. There's lots of analysis. There's occasional breaking news stories that have to be covered that are serious. But for the most part, we're there to have fun and celebrate the game, and 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 hopefully um, that comes through. Yeah. You mentioned Mike Greenberg. Uh, Mike Greenberg took over the Sunday NFL Countdown host chair that was held so long by Chris Berman. And to me, uh, I wrote that I, I thought he was the perfect choice because I think he's the best interviewer host who gets the most out of his guests. And as you said, you know, he walks into this – Tyree Kill situation yeah. and it's breaking news. Did that play to his strings? Because now he doesn't have to worry about it. He just does what he's done a thousand times, which is cover a breaking news story. Yeah, and that happened in the first hour, right? I mean, it was so, it was, you know, obviously um, Tyreek was on the way to the stadium, so it was very early in the day, uh, pregame. Um, and yeah, I, I think, you know, I was, I was texting Jimmy Patero, my boss, and I said, I mean, thank goodness we have him right now because it was, it was, it was masterful when you consider that this was his first time on the show, first time with that cast. Right. Um, you saw his sort of core competency come out immediately. And you're right, he's a great you know, traffic cop. He, he hones in on what people are saying. He builds on what people are saying. Um, and it was just the perfect scenario for him. And by the way, I think it made him very comfortable right out of the shoot, too, because that felt like, you know, Okay, I know what I know what I'm doing. Here, right, right. He didn't tell me that, but I I, fe I felt like you know you could vis you could visibly see him become more comfortable, um, and it's only going to get better. Yeah. You know? uh, this year, uh, ESPN hired two of the greatest coaches of all time. Obviously, Bill Belichick is appearing on the Manning cast. He appeared last night. Nick Saban is on College Game Day. To me, one of the big surprises of this season has been how comfortable and at ease these two irascible, grumpy old coaches have been. You know, we, we saw Belichick, I'm on to Cincinnati. We saw uh, Saban, get out of my face. <laughs> what happened, Burke? Rat poison, right? right. He, he called uh, one question yeah. uh, uh, famously from the, the podium. But um, it's a great question. I mean, listen, I, 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 I kind of grew up on the college side uh, of the business at ESPN. 
So I've known Coach Saban for, for many, many years. And we had had him on enough you know, over the years. I mean, think about the number of times College Game Day found itself in Tuscaloosa at Alabama. And he was always smart enough to make sure that he came out for a segment on the set, even when he was coaching the team. And then on the rare occasions that he wasn't deep into the college football playoff or, or maybe just not in the championship game, we would get him to be on the set you know, uh, at our coverage of the CFP. Right. And even then we knew, you know, because of how guarded and how reserved he had to be as an active coach, we weren't going to get 100% of his personality. Um, we knew he was going to be he was going to be good, um, you know, and, and, you know, we, we have a, you know, we have a, 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 a succession planning, a circumstance with Coach Corso, who, by the way, like has a seat on college game day for as long as he would like it, um, you know, uh, and Nick was very, you know, very uh, concerned that, you know, he wasn't replacing Lee Corso, yeah. but we knew that um, he was going to be good, and he, we knew based on the relationship he had, with Kirk Herbstreet in particular, and now Pat McAfee, um, that he would be comfortable enough to really let himself, you know, go. Yeah. And so we've been extremely pleased with the results from from Coach Saban. You know, Belichick's taken a, a different route. I mean, he really is. He he he's, he didn't, and I think his instincts were correct here potentially. He didn't really have an interest in doing a full time gig in a traditional studio setting. Yeah. Nor did he want to call games as an analyst, right? And I don't necessarily think that plays to his strengths. So I think that was good instincts. And so we got into a couple environments, um, two of them with us, with you know a regular spot on McAfee's show, and then also 11 Manning casts. Plus we're doing you know a, a, an original series with him where Peyton and Bill break down uh, or look ahead to the coming Monday night uh, football game called Breakdown um, that, you know, and if you, those of you who may remember a show we did in the early days of ESPN Plus called Kobe, uh, Kobe Bryant Detail, it's sort of a PhD level analysis of football looking ahead to the coming games that we can air as an episode on ESPN Plus and we can also splice up and put on SportsCenter and on right. Countdown and NFL Live and, and stuff. So we're, we're thrilled. We have them in these three different ways, actually. Uh, and I think he's going to be very, very good. But he has also been very open about you know, hoping to coach again, yeah. wanting to coach again. And, uh, and so, you know, what, what he's committed to do uh, for us and others that really allows for that possibility. All this that ESPN is doing in football is leading up to one big event, their first Super Bowl. ESPN has always wanted a Super Bowl. The last Super Bowl that was on ABC was under the old ABC Sports. So in 2027, ESPN will televise its first Super Bowl. Tell us about it. Yeah, so we had Super Bowl 40, if you recall, in yes. Detroit on ABC. I, I, was, I was around. I, just, I, wasn't, I was there. I was not involved. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, yeah, it's so much time has gone past. And, yeah, and that was kind of the old ABC sports construct, um, uh, which no longer re exists. And, and, you know, so this really feels like a remarkable opportunity for us. We intend over the next, we have about two and a half years, um, you know, before February 14th, 2027. Not that it's already imprinted right. in my brain. Valentine's By the way, day. Valentine's Day. Yeah. So <laughs> how about that coincidence? Nice but, gift to ESPN. Yeah, yeah. Um, in L.A., so we know where it's going to be. Um, as part of the, the, the overall uh, reorganization of our content team that, that we recently announced, um, we also determined that we wanted to have a full-time position uh, that's dedicated to just sort of project managing the Super Bowl for us, right? Because the, even the people who work on NFL at ESPN, you know, they're, they're very busy, and oftentimes they do other things as well. So seasonally, they work on other sports. You know, it was very, very important to me that we had a, a, a person and a small team of people built around this leader who... Um, you know, who are fully dedicated. During recent media day in ESPN, you said ESPN wants to cover the Super Bowl like it's never been covered before. Yeah. Does that mean we're going to see a Manning cast? Oh, for sure. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Um, <laughs> if we didn't, I, I think we'd, I'd have a problem with those two <laughs> fellas. But uh, yeah, yeah, that's going to be definitely a part of it. Um, you know, what I'm focused on is, is, is um, 
the week leading up, right? right. Um, you know, the other networks um, certainly do, you know, a tremendous job with the game, with game day, oftentimes with, you know, the day or two before. We're looking at it from sort of the moment that the championship games are over until, you know, probably the day or two after the yeah. Super Bowl itself is over, right, as, as a massive window, right? I think somebody on my team calculated how many hours that is, and right. it's kind of like, hmm, could we have like a, you know, a thousand-hour pregame show or whatever the, <laughs> the, the case may be? I, the red eye will prevent me from doing that math right now for sure. But, you know, like we're really looking at that, the entire window of time, you know, leading, you know, leading into the game from, yeah. from Championship Sunday. Let's switch over to uh, talent. Uh, when we were up in Bristol, we asked uh, Jimmy Pitaro about the state of e uh, Stephen A's contract negotiations. Yeah. He said ESPN wants to stay in business with Stephen A. He's a needle mover. He's a star. What can you tell us? Well, first of all, I rarely disagree with my boss, and I will not do it on this one either. Um, he, he's absolutely right. Like, Stephen A is a, is a bona fide superstar. Um, he's so versatile. He's so hardworking. You know, he brings, you know, a built-in audience that's very, very loyal. He's created, um, you know, a real juggernaut in, in uh, first take. You know, you, you guys had... Uh, yeah, you know, he, he, he gave you his assessment of the competition yes. uh, over the years. Annihilation. Yeah, anni total annihilation, yes. I think he said. But, but, um, but yeah, he, he's, he's a great, great um, uh, talent. He's a, he's, a, he's a superstar by any definition. He's a, he's a wonderful person, and, and, and we're really fond of saying, because this is absolutely true, nobody works harder than this guy. Like, nobody. Like, he's, he's, he, he's always on, whether it's first take the show, or whether it's his own activities on social, whether it's his appearances on other shows like NBA Countdown, whether he just pops up on SportsCenter, whether he literally walks in on Greeny sometimes. We get up and all of a sudden we have like, you know, he's on that show. So uh, he's got his own podcast. He's got his own, uh, his other activities that he's, you know, he's continuing to delve into. You know, he's made his aspirations uh, very clear and, and frankly, he, he should. He deserves it. He's a very creative and very talented person that you know we hope to be in business with for a really long time. Yeah, he told us he grew up idolizing Howard Cosell, Hollis Queens, and yeah. that he would like to contribute to Monday Night Countdown in some yeah. uh, capacity. Do you see that happening? Yeah, he, he's made that, he's made that um, uh, clear as well. And, and you know, where I sit on that is, and, and you can see this already developing, you know, the philosophy that we put our biggest names and our biggest talent on our biggest properties and biggest shows is really, to me, a, a recipe for success, yeah. right? Uh, in Bristol, uh, Jimmy called the, your weekday daytime lineup a murderer's row. Yeah. You, know, you got Get Up, you got First Take, then you got Pat McAfee. Right. Except McAfee's a little different. If you don't know, McAfee doesn't directly work for ESPN except for his college game day. He actually licenses a show. And as we all know, Pat has been involved in some yeah. controversial situations. How do you manage and give feedback to McAfee? Pat's different on a couple different levels. Pat's just ahead of the curve because, frankly, he developed his show um, creatively and technically on his own, outside of ESPN. We had nothing to do with it, right? We take no credit for the success he, you know, he has realized. So yeah, he, and he, he, has, he has done some things and said some things that, re that required um, you know, us to have conversations. It's a very productive uh, uh, relationship that he has with myself, with Jimmy, this guy named Mike Foss, who you know, yep. who, who essentially runs the show. Um, Pat is extremely open to, you know, he, never once has he been like, you know, despite the construct of the relationship, I don't want to talk to you guys, leave me alone. You right. know this is, this is what you signed up for. He's, it's never been any of that. It's always been like, how can I get better? You know, he appreciates the, the megaphone that ESPN provides to, to him and to his, his aspirations and his business. Um, you know, so he, he, uh, he's very open to that. But, you know, it's a, it's a situation, it's different for us, right? It's different in many, many ways, so it requires a different level of oversight and management. 
Let's end with the biggest soap opera of the year, uh, which was the NBA rights negotiations. Yeah. Uh, every time we in the media reported that we were done, they went on another two months. So congratulations on extending your deal with the NBA and yeah. also maintaining uh, exclusive, exclusive rights to the NBA final. Right now, you have uh, Doris and Mike yeah. as your number one team. Do you see going forward into the next season keeping a two-person booth, or do you see adding a third analyst like you did last year? We have the best NBA play-by-play -play voice by far, right? Mike Breen is rock solid. Like three, I think, Emmys in a row for play-by-play -play in that, in that cat. Think of all yeah. the people that could be, that are nominated in the play-by-play -play category for the Emmys. Mike is the absolute best. And so we have that foundation, and I think we're gonna take our time and figure out you know, exactly who fits best and, and who creates the best experience for fans. In a perfect world, could you see Charles Barkley uh, with ESPN. Yeah, yeah. That would be a perfect world, actually. <laughs> um, no, I, like, uh, Charles is a singular talent. Um, you know, again, I think this season is going to be a little bit of a bridge to the future, both for us and for the, you know, the NBA and for, uh, for Turner and, and, and NBC getting into the, into the mix and Amazon getting into the mix going forward. So, um, you know, I, I, I would be lying if, we, if I said we weren't interested in Charles. I think the entire industry is interested in Charles. Um, he's really that special. Yeah. Um, so we'll see. I don't know. I, I just keep reassuring people that, you know, if you come work for us, that doesn't mean you have to, like this narrative that got started that says, if you come work for us, you also have to do 200 episodes of First Take or Get Up. No, no, no. The no. car wash. The car wash, no. The car wash is for people who want their car washed. <laughs> You know, if you don't, then you don't have to. Um, you know, this was part of the conversation we had with Jason Kelsey. You know, somebody had put it in his head that he was going to have to, you know, you know, work 200 things a year for us. And I said, no, we would like you for this show. If you want to do more stuff, that's fine. Yeah. But, but we want you for Monday Night Countdown. Yeah. And we've seen that with Aikman and Buck, you know, oh, when, sure. when they appear on a get up or something, it's by their choice. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So. Yeah, long-winded long way of saying Charles would be uh, a great addition, but uh, there's a lot of things to resolve before that. Well, Burke, thank you for your time, and please yeah. give it up for thank you. First Magnus. Forty Niners running back Jordan Mason had a fantastic game on Monday, running for 147 yards against the Jets. He had the starting job because Christian McCaffrey had a lingering calf and Achilles injury. He was hoping to play, but was announced as inactive 90 minutes before the game. But Mason may have gotten his team in trouble when he was asked by ESPN reporter Lisa Salters when he knew he would be starting, and he replied, maybe Friday, Friday night. Why is that a problem? Because McCaffrey was still listed as questionable at that point. Teams are expected to be honest about their players' availability so that there is a level playing field for opposing teams preparing for the game and a level playing field for sportsbooks setting betting lines. If the Niners were essentially lying about the possibility of McCaffrey playing, then that could at least result in a fine. Mason became emotional in a press conference after the game when asked the same question, saying, this is why I don't like talking to the media. Coach Kyle Shanahan said that Mason only knew for sure that he was starting on Monday. We'll see if the league agrees. Staying in the Bay Area, a judge threw out a lawsuit challenging the Oakland A's public funding in Nevada. That will help them move toward building a stadium there, which is good for them because they are already burning bridges in Sacramento before playing a game there. In response to an inquiry from Sports Illustrated's Jason Burke regarding what happens if the A's make the playoffs during their time in Sacramento, the team said that, quote, home postseason games are not guaranteed to be played at Sutter Health Park. In the event a home postseason game occurs at an alternate location, A's season ticket holders will have priority purchase access for tickets. The reason, presumably, is that their Sacramento home will have a capacity of 14,000 and they can make more money playing playoff games elsewhere. And look, it's hard to come up with new things to say about A's owner John Fisher, but no one else does this to their fans. No team is so willing to burn relationships with the people that make them matter in exchange for some short-term cash. That's why the A's never kept their stars in the Fisher era. It's why their stadium has fallen into disrepair. It's why they're going to Sacramento and it's triple-digit summers next year, and why they are supposedly moving to Vegas a few years after that. A different owner would have a packed house watching postseason games in Oakland. A medical test can reveal your body's biological age, which can show if you are aging prematurely. 
Better nutrition has been shown to reverse one's bioage. My hope of living longer and healthier is why I take Field of Greens. Field of Greens is an organic superfood fruit and vegetable drink unlike any other. It's serious nutrition. Listen to this. Field of Greens was approved for a university study that doctors believe may lower your body's biological age. That generally means better health. Each fruit and vegetable in Field of Greens was selected by doctors to support vital body functions like heart, liver, kidneys, metabolism, and immune system. Only Field of Greens is backed by this better health promise. At your next physical or checkup, your doctor will notice your improved health or your money back. Join me in better health with 15% off and free shipping. Visit fieldofgreens.com and use promo code FOS. That's promo code FOS at fieldofgreens.com. Fieldofgreens.com. NFL quarterbacks are reaching new levels with their contracts, and my next guest is helping to make that happen. Brian Murphy is the co-founder and CEO of Athletes First, one of the top agencies in the NFL. We spoke about how contracts are changing, what it means on his end, and the story behind some of the biggest deals we've seen this year, including Dak Prescott's record-setting contract. That conversation is next. I'm joined now by Brian Murphy, CEO and founder of Athletes First. Welcome, Brian. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Yeah, great to have you on. So uh, first, let's just get to know the, your agency a little bit. What's the, the scope and the approach of Athletes First? Sure. Athletes First, uh, we founded Athletes First in 2001, and we represent about 250 NFL players, probably about 200 uh, uh, coaches, both college and uh, pro front office personnel. And uh, approach is really simple. It's, uh, you know, like the name says, put the athletes first. We try to uh, build a family culture and really uh, focus on the personal side of, of the clients as well as the business. And, um, you know, trying to build an experience uh, that will enrich the lives of our athletes. Dak Prescott just signed this you know, record setting for your $240 million deal. When did negotiations around that start? So I think Todd France, uh, one of my equity partners, he was obviously the lead negotiator on the Dak Prescott deal. And he did that deal primarily with AJ Stevens. And then, you know, we all support him any way we can. And I think like any negotiations, uh, negotiations probably started right when the last contract ended, right? I mean, they did, uh, Todd did a great job on, uh, you know, not allowing the franchise tag to be applied. And, and um, so as soon as that deal was done, you know, Dak went out and did what he did on the field. Dak did what he did off the field. And I'm sure uh, Jerry and Steven were in, in constant communication with uh, Todd throughout and um, end up with a great result. And the timing of it was interesting. It was right before his first game of the season. This was, of course, going to be his last season under contract. Um, do, do you think that, I mean, obviously that uh, provided some impetus to get a deal done, um, but did kind of just waiting, not holding out, but just waiting till things were getting close to the end. Uh, do you think that that helped get that record setting deal? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think every negotiation is different, right? Like, you know, and every negotiator is different. So Todd France is different than Dave Mulligetta is different than myself is different than Cal McCarthy, Ryan Williams. And so, uh, every agent has their own approach, but the approach has to be, uh, athlete, uh, centered, you know, and, you know, I've worked with some athletes where, you know, I mentioned, uh, hey, maybe we should sit out of practice or maybe we should have an injury. They're like, no, I, I'd rather, I mean, I'd rather retire than miss a practice, right? And then other players feel differently. And I think um, in this case with Todd and uh, Dak and their whole team, I think, you know, they're very clear they wanted to be in Dallas. Uh, Dak wants to win the Super Bowl in Dallas. Uh, Todd wanted him to be in Dallas. That's what Dak wanted. Uh, Jerry and Steve felt the same thing. And just like when you and I are in school, like, um, you know, we have an exam on Monday, we'll be ready for the exam on Monday, but, you know, we won't be ready Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. You know, I think deadlines really uh, help uh, move deals along, and, and particularly when both sides want the same thing. And I think in this case, you know, uh, both sides wanted Dak to be a cowboy for, for his career. And so uh, they, they tied up the next four years and everyone wins. It was great. Yeah, and the the length of the the deal is interesting. That seems to be kind of the new sweet spot for these star deals is four years. I mean, he could be looking at another major deal in four years. Um, is, is that essentially the goal of you know not doing this is the rest of his career, but you know four years and then we'll see. Absolutely. I mean, one thing in athletes first, we try to emphasize like especially with quarterbacks, you know, almost the shorter the deal, the better. I mean, because if you think about the quarterback market, like the housing market. If you knew housing prices were going to go up, you know, dramatically every, you know, every year, you know, you don't want to tie yourself into an eight or nine or 10 year deal, you know. And so 
uh, it's really been a, a point of emphasis for all of the all the agents at Athletes First is that you know with the gambling money, with the TV money, with the media rights, uh, we're seeing you know unprecedented uh, hikes in the salary cap, and so we we don't want to tie ourselves up for a long time. Um, we believe in our clients; they believe in themselves. And so, like this case, I mean, the last deal was four years, and, and Todd got back to the table and um, was able to uh, get him sixty million dollars a year, which I think is also like being overlooked a little bit. Like it, the, it, it wasn't like he, you know, went like Joe Burrow and Jordan Love and and and, and everyone, and then just went a million dollars. It went five million dollars above uh, these deals on a four-year deal. So it was a dramatic increase in, in the quarterback landscape and. Uh, I think all the quarterbacks could benefit from it. And I think that's one thing that was important to Dak as well. And, and, and our other quarterback clients, like, you know, people, you know, they're not just doing it for themselves. And yes, the money is great for themselves, but they need to look out for their brethren, their four other quarterbacks who are putting the bodies on the line. And, you know, the, every quarterback who goes raises it to the next level and everyone benefits from it. So um, it's been great. And it's been really fun having athletes first be involved with, you know, with so many quarterbacks at the top, because we can set that stage, we can get the short term deal, and we can really uh, set the precedent that we want going forward. And, and everyone benefits all the other quarterbacks and all the other agents. And for all the reasons that you're, you're laying out for why uh, the athletes want these these shorter big deals, do the teams are, are they pushing back and saying, you know, could you give us five, six years, seven years, because, you know, if, if it's good for not to make it a zero sum game, but in a way it is, it's good for the athlete. Certainly the team, you know, would like to lock him in for longer. Absolutely, Owen. I mean, it's a thing is this, like what what fans sometimes, uh, you know, forget, right, is like there some of the uh, contracts guaranteed, like in, in, in Dak's uh, case, Todd and AJ did a great job getting $231 million guarantee. But if there's a fifth year, it wouldn't be guaranteed. If there's a sixth year, seventh year, eighth year. So if you do like a 10-year contract and it's $60 million, like you can say, hey, I did a $600 million contract. But the reality is because there's no guaranteed money in five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, every year is an audition for the player. And if the player is worth the money, the team will pay it. If the player is not worth the money, they cut him. If the player is worth way more money, uh, you have no choice. You have five years left, so you can't renegotiate the deal. So every additional year that's not guaranteed is 100% to the team's advantage. And that's why the teams, the teams if they could, they do a 10-year deal all day long because – they get an option every single year. Do I want the player? Or do we not want the player? So we try to we, we we try to avoid that as much as possible. And do you think we're going to see another Patrick Mahomes deal anytime soon? Where you know generational player locked in for ten years uh, for four hundred fifty million dollars. Obviously, he's doing just fine. But uh, do you think we're, we're that that the the ethos has shifted. Yeah, I mean, I think again, like um, you know, I'm sure Patrick Mahomes signed a deal that Patrick Mahomes wanted, right? I mean, he had, he had all the leverage in the world, and he's a phenomenal player, and he's won Super Bowls, and so each contract has to be uh, unique to the player, and you have to, you know, reportedly put the athlete first. And so, if there's another player who says, "Hey, listen, I just, I just want to, I just want a ten year deal because I, I want that number for whatever reason." Because it doesn't give you the security because, again, you can get cut in a year. It doesn't guarantee you can be with that team. We've done a lot of studies that show it doesn't really impact whether you can win the Super Bowl or not. So I, I, we would hope from Athletes First point of view on behalf of our quarterbacks that we stay away from the 10-year deals or the 8-year deals or 7-year deals and all agents try to do 4-year deals. But, again, you have to do what the client wants. And if uh, someone, if a star quarterback like Patrick Mahomes wants a 10-year deal, then they should get it. Go get it because, uh, again, he – I don't know Patrick, but I'm sure he's fine and he's living a great life. He's winning a lot of Super Bowls. So, uh, yeah, I think a, a lot of quarterbacks should probably take a 10 year deal if they could guarantee themselves uh, two or three Super Bowl rings. But, um, I, you know, I hope we don't see that again. You know, I hope we just, you know, focus on the shorter term deals. I think that's best for the uh, the athlete, but um, each athlete's different. So, you also have Jordan Love and Tua Tagovailoa. Uh, they signed very similar deals around 220 million. I think it's Tua got 212 um, with similar amounts guaranteed on the same day last summer. Um, is there a particular story there in terms of how they, how all that came together? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think the one thing that we pride ourselves on athletes first is we're, we're a complete team, you know, and obviously each uh, negotiation has a lead negotiator and we're very lucky that we have, you know, six or seven A plus negotiators. So with Jordan Love, it was Dave Mulligetta, who by the way, uh, uh, just became the first agent in the history of the NFL to negotiate a billion dollars of deals in one year. So 
Uh, David, uh, we're announcing that today, so announce it here. Uh, David is the first uh, agent in NFL history to lead the negotiations for a billion dollars, which is quite the story from a, uh, you know, a, a one-time uh, athlete's first intern to now probably uh, the greatest NFL agent ever lived. So um, he, he, he led Jordan Love's uh, negotiations. And then Ryan Williams, also a former uh, intern, both equity partners now, uh, Ryan and David. Ryan started with us in 2002, uh, looking around, calling around for uh, – looking for marketing deals for a, a disgruntled safety for uh, 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 Tampa Bay who thought he should get more marketing down in Tampa Bay uh, by the name of John Lynch. So that's how uh, 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 Ryan started his career. Uh, and he did uh, Tua's deal. He was the lead negotiator for Tua's deal. And so Ryan and David and A.J. Stevens, who works on all of our deals, are in constant communication. And there's definitely a strategy as to who should go first and who should go second. And in that case, those two agents and AJ, they, they uh, talked, they compared notes, and they figured out what was best for both athletes. And I think uh, there was a, a reason they came done on the same day, and there was a reason they went in that order. And uh, very proud of Ryan and David for that teamwork, because teamwork is something you don't often see in, in, in our industry. And also, I think it just also points to the power. Like, if you have, uh, you know, if you could get all the star quarterbacks under one agency's roof, you have that much more leverage, that much more knowledge, and you get better deals. But, yeah, there's definitely a strategy there. Uh, Ryan and David would probably both uh, fire me if I disclosed what that strategy was. But uh, it happened for a reason. And I think, again, everyone benefited. The Packers, the Dolphins, both players, and, of course, our agency. You also represented a former Packer, Aaron Rodgers. Um, so he, he just announced his a Netflix documentary called Enigma. Um you know, he's he's obviously a controversial figure. He's he's someone who really puts himself out there, likes to be um, on camera. Um, also, you know, says things that people object to and that, you know, generates a lot of headlines, positive and negative. Um, what's it like to, you know, have a, you know, a very high profile client like that who makes all sorts of off the field headlines? Again, the beautiful thing about Athletes First is we have a phenomenal uh, team of agents. And one of those agents and my co-founder uh, is David Dunn. And David Dunn has been around for a long time. You know, I, I started the business in 1999 at Steinberg, Morad and Dunn. Uh, Dunn was an equity partner then. David was an equity partner then. So he's been around, you know, since the early 80s, you know, and he started his career with, uh, you know, Warren Moon and Troy Aikman and, and Steve Young. And so... He was uh, the godfather of these amazing uh, NFL contracts, and he's done all the contracts for uh, Aaron Rodgers, you know, uh, last three or four contracts for Aaron Rodgers. And so Dave's a, uh, primarily a point person for Aaron. But I'll say, you know, as an agency, it's, it's phenomenal to have uh, a talent like Aaron Rodgers, to state the obvious. I mean, he, he uh, saying that we represent Aaron Rodgers gives us amazing credibility with everyone else. But, you know, in my, my interaction with Aaron, like he's an incredibly intelligent person. Uh, he's very thoughtful. Uh, he's very mindful. And uh, I've learned a lot uh, watching him over the years and interacting him over the years in terms of like, you know, he's going to be his, his own self. And I think that's a great lesson for all of our younger um, clients. It's one reason we just launched this new uh, content series called Rearview Mirror that we started last night with Tua is that we really want to encourage all of our athletes like, listen, you know, be yourself, be authentic. You know, you don't have to be perfect. You can, and you don't have to uh, toe the line. You don't have to toe the company line. You don't have to, you know, say what people want you to say. You're, you're, you're a kid, you know, and, and by kid, I'm 53 years old, so I can say that, but you're in your 20s, in your 30s, you know, maybe mid 30s and Aaron's point. Like you, you are more than a quarterback and go out and show people that you're more than a quarterback. Like, just like I'm an agent, but hopefully I'm not defined by being an agent. Hopefully everything else I do in life is, is what they put on my tombstone. And I think, in that way, Aaron Rodgers is just a phenomenal role model in terms of letting people know that I'm, I'm not just a quarterback. You know, I'm so much more than a quarterback, and he is. He happens to be extremely talented, maybe as talented as anyone at that position, and so he gets paid well to, to play that position. But there's so much more to him. There's so much more to Tua. There's so much more to Jordan. So much more to all of our Pladak and everyone else that it's uh, we're really trying to create those platforms so um, – quarterbacks can show people like yourself, Owen, like both a media person and a fan of the game, that they're more than just a quarterback. And I think that's important. And I think we're, we're making headway there. Uh, there's some pushback, but, you know, I think the, the more that we can give these people platforms like Aaron and his documentary, I can't wait to watch it. Um, Enigma is probably a great name for it, but, you know, I think everyone who watched it will learn a lot about who Aaron Rodgers is. And that's a great lesson to learn because he's got a lot to offer. 
Brian Murphy, really enjoyed the chat. Thanks so much for joining no, us. Oh, well, thank you for having me. Good luck with everything. I love I love your podcast and love front office sports. You guys are great. So uh, appreciate you having me on. Time now for Front Office Sports Tomorrow, where we take a look at what's coming up in the business of sports. After a long and winding journey, Kumar Rocker is finally getting his call up to the big leagues. Rocker was originally drafted by the New York Mets with the 10th overall pick in 2021, but the Mets declined to sign him after reviewing his medical information. He spent a year in relative anonymity before the Rangers surprisingly picked him with the third overall pick with the 2022 draft, teaming him up with former Vanderbilt teammate Jack Leiter, who the Rangers had drafted with the second overall pick in the year before. After making six starts for the high A team, Hickory Crawdads in 2023, it was announced that Rocker required Tommy John surgery, ending his season. Rocker returned at the start of the 2024 season with the Texas Rangers Rookie League team, where he was quickly promoted to AA Frisco Rough Riders. After compiling a 0.46 ERA over five starts, Rocker was promoted to AAA. Tomorrow, he finally gets his chance at the big leagues against the Seattle Mariners. With his debut, Rocker will be the first player of Indian descent in MLB history. In just two games, Florida State is raising all kinds of questions about its future. The team is now 0-2 after losing to Georgia Tech and Boston College. The team, of course, dominated the ACC last year, winning every game in conference and going 13-1 overall. Their exclusion from the college football playoff ramped up efforts for them to leave the ACC, a move that is now tied up in lawsuits. Florida politicians made a lot of noise about the corruption of the NCAA and its media partners. The bad start has an added sting. The team has an NIL budget of around $12 million this year. There's still time to turn things around, but one more loss might doom their hopes of even making the 12-team college football playoff. That's it for today. If you're enjoying the show, tell a friend, send us your thoughts about anything we've covered by sending an email to today at frontofficesports.com. Thanks for listening. We'll see you tomorrow.